Hello, I'm your host, Ray Dogum, and welcome to Vibecast. Thank you for joining us as we explore the exciting advancements in technology-enabled collaboration to excel important drug development. Vibe Bio seeks to find every cure for every community. We think big as no one should be left behind in the pursuit of living a healthy, happy, and productive life free from disease. Collectively, we have the skills, we have the technology, and we have the passion. We now need the community catalyst to bring that all together. And that's Vibe. We see a future where communities of biopharma experts and patients collaborate to identify high potential medicines and have the ability to access capital on demand to develop them. The Vibecast is our weekly informational podcast where we explore some of the hottest topics in drug development and technology innovation with some of the dynamic people that make up the Vibe community. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guests today are Nikki Marco and Dr. Jordi Durant. Nikki is Director of Family Support at Chelsea's Hope and a mother with a daughter named Angelina who was diagnosed with Lafour disease. Dr. Jordi Duran is a biomedical researcher and professor from Barcelona and is working on research for rare diseases, especially Lafour disease. And in this podcast, we'll cover what is Lafour disease, how patient communities can enable faster research funding, and how they are spreading awareness through a documentary called Fighting the Rare. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd ask you both to also introduce yourselves for the audience, just to give a you know more detailed view on who you are and your history. Uh, maybe we can start with Dr. Jordi Duran, and then we can go to Nikki. Hi. So yes, as you said, I'm, I am Dr. Jordi Duran. I am a biomedical researcher. I study how uh, the brain works from the metabolic point of view. Uh, and, and how it, it deteriorates in certain conditions, in certain diseases. And, and one of these diseases, and the one I study uh, with more passion, is Lafora disease. Uh, and that's how I became interested in, in this disease. And Nikki? Well, yeah, my name is Nikki. Um, I come from, well, I live in Sydney, Australia, and I've got a mother. Uh, I'm a mother of a 19 year old girl named Angelina, and she's got Lafora disease. Um, so I got on the board of Chelsea's Hope, look for a children's fund to help find a cure. Um, before that, I had a full-time career in uh, with a background in corporate marketing. Um, so I did start as the director of marketing and communications, but now I've moved on um, to be the director of family support to help families just like mine. And I appreciate you both coming on here and talking to us today and or, or from around the world, really, Barcelona, Sydney, Australia. So, um, you know, thanks for taking the time whenever the time is for you. Uh, so maybe what we could do first is just get started on what is Lafour disease for people who might not be aware of this. Sure, maybe, Dr. Duran, if you'd like yes. to cover that. Lafour disease is a rare disease. Actually, it's an ultra rare disease. Uh, so uh, this means that very few people have it. Uh, this condition. It is a genetic disease, an inherited uh, disease, and it's neurodegenerative. So it's a neurologic uh, condition that progressively implies the deterioration of the brain. So the onset of the disease is uh, in adolescents, in, in perfectly healthy, smart uh, kids. So before that, the kids don't have any symptom, any problem. And, and then um, the, fir uh, the first symptom appears, which is normally uh, in the form of generalized seizures, so epileptic seizures. Uh, that's why it's, it's very commonly, uh, the disease is very commonly misdiagnosed uh, by medical professors, uh, professionals as uh, juvenile myoclonic uh, epilepsy. So the, the hallmark of the disease is the accumulation of uh, this glycogen aggregate. So in these pictures on the left, you can see a normal brain, while on the right, in the pictures on the right, you can see a Lafora disease brain, all this brownish, uh, aggregates that you see in the Lafora disease brain shouldn't be here. So this is uh, these are uh, glycogen aggregates. So glycogen is a normal uh, component of the brain. Actually, glycogen plays very important roles in, our, in the normal functioning of, of the brain. But in the disease, this uh, glycogen um, accumulates. And, and in, in LD, that's in Lafora disease, there's um, accumulation of glycogen that the body cannot break down. And so it, it builds up over time and the accumulation of this uh, glycogen damages uh, brain cells. And that's why the, all the symptoms of the disease appear. So we 
identified some years ago, and uh, not only us, but not only our research group, but other groups in the world, uh, and it identified that this is the, the cause of this. So the cause, what harms the brain and the nervous tissue in La Fora disease is the accumulation of this, uh, these glycogen aggregates. So this is a genetic disease. It's caused by mutations in genes. Actually, it is a particular case in which there are two genes that can be mutated, and mutations in one or the other give the exact uh, same disease. One is laforin, one is called laforin, the other one is called malin. So mutations in both laforin or malin give uh, the same disease, lafora disease. You can see here like a, a summary of the different mutations in the, in the two genes that can um, give rise to the, to the disease. This implies that both proteins are working together to prevent the accumulation of these glycogen aggregates. So in the absence of one or the other, um, in with, when there is mutations in one or the other, the disease is exactly the same. So it is, a, as I was saying, an ultra rare disease. So it's not that um, uh, it, it's not only a, a rare, but an ultra rare disease, which means that very, very few people uh, have the disease. So uh, the estimated prevalence is maybe one in one million. It depends, of course, on the region of and, and also um, there are some regions where there might be, there, it might be di uh, underdiagnosed. Of course, like in underdeveloped countries, it might be underdiagnosed. But we would say that overall in, in the whole world, we probably have between 300 and 400 cases only. So it is an ultra rare disease. Very few people has the disease. And so the symptoms, I as I was saying, the first uh, symptoms are normally in the form of seizures, epileptic seizures, either tonic clonic seizures or absence uh, um, uh, seizures, which means that the patient is like um, completely uh, um, absent. So like if daydreaming, uh, but this is the initial symptom. Normally from then on, there is cognitive decline. This means that the patient starts having problems to, you know, um, remember things to you know process things and to um, solve problems let's say so what is known as childhood dementia as, as would happen in alzheimer's this is for instance in, in in older people but in this case in in children also um ataxia which means lack of uh, muscle coordination so they have problems to move properly they also have this visual hallucinations uh, also, they, they can have uh, behavioral changes. They can have, they can have uh, depression and aggressivity. So all these symptoms come from the uh, progressive uh, degeneration of the of the brain of the nervous tissue. And sadly, the the prognosis of the disease is very bad. So the survival the survival time after the first symptoms is more around ten years. So yeah, the, this is a very um, severe uh, neurodegenerative condition that affects uh, uh, children. Yeah. First of all, thank you for sharing all that. And, it, you know, it sounds, it is a very terrible disease. And one thing I read in my research as well, um, head of research at the Childhood Dementia Initiative, so in Australia, says that one in 2,800 babies born will develop dementia in childhood. So it's not a small number of babies. And so that's 129 babies born each year in Australia, one every three days. Uh, it's estimated that almost 2,300 Australians are currently living with childhood dementia, which can add up to like 700,000 people worldwide. So although it's an ultra rare disease, um, you know, specifically the four disease, this idea or this broader category of childhood dementia is a serious issue. And there could be relationships between the four disease and how the other diseases manifest themselves too. So, you know, that's why the research that you're doing and others are doing are, are is so important. Um, so thanks for doing that. Anything else uh, maybe you'd like to share about the disease? Um, no, I mean, as you were saying, uh, La Fora disease is only one of the diseases that causes with uh, childhood dementia. There are many other conditions in which there is childhood dementia. So we tend to think about dementia. When we think about dementia, we tend to think of old people, you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease, other uh, diseases that uh, uh, cause with, with dementia, dementia, but there is also childhood dementia. And as you were saying, the numbers, this affects quite a lot of people. So between all these other diseases together, the numbers are uh, quite high, you know? And Yeah, and, you know, we talked about the numbers and like how the symptoms look like, but now I want to get to Nikki and talk about, you know, the real life experience you've had with Angelina and how you've had to cope and work with many doctors and researchers along your journey. Um, so please, if you don't mind sharing about 
your experience? Well, my daughter, Angelina, she was perfectly healthy um, until she was 14. So there was nothing wrong with her. Um, and then just one day she was setting the table as she normally did. And she started dropping the glasses and they were smashing on the floor. And we're like, what's going on? And she's like, mum, I don't know. I don't know. And we're calling the ambulance and we went a few times and, you know, escalating neuro, um, the neurologist appointment to see what's going on. And then a couple of weeks after these symptoms started, she had a generalized tonic clonic in my hands. Um, and it was very traumatic um, because I'd never seen a seizure before and especially in your own child and she was falling to the ground and um, it, yeah it still it still haunts me to this day um, that that moment um, because you know as I said it, it, there was no signs there's no signs of anything beforehand um, you know and then slowly uh, uh, well she got firstly she got misdiagnosed with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy because it mimics this the three types of seizures which is the absent seizures um as dr geordie um Joran explained um so it's like the blinking and the and they just sort of like they're daydreaming and they're sort of they're not there um so they're they're having interrupted thoughts and then um you've got the myoclonic seizures which is like the shaking um, that you see sort of, sort of in alzheimer's but the absence and the myoclonic come together so they're sort of like um I call them like electric shocks. It's like they're having electric shocks in their body um, and they do actually feel that. So they do feel pain with, with that. Um, and then also the tonic clonics, which are the big ones that are more common that people, you know, see more where the absence of my clinic, they're very hard to detect. So it's, it's hard. And, you know, I mean, I wasn't from the medical field, or, you know, and to, to be able to recognize this in my child was really um, difficult. And um, it's very intense having to watch and make sure, because if they increase um, quickly in frequency, it's actually quite dangerous. So you have to administer emergency medication. So it's 24 seven care. Um, that that's what's happened now. And then um, over nine months after she started having the seizures, she started getting cognitive decline. And that was presented at school. She was playing with friends and she wasn't following the instructions and they would get annoyed with her. And um, so, and she come, she came home crying. So I rang the neurologist and I said, I think you, you're sedating her, whatever these epilepsy medications, you know, they're, they're sedating her. We've got to do something. And she said, no, it's not the medication. I think she needs to come into hospital for tests. So we went in for tests um, and they kept trying things and uh, they did a VEEG, a video EEG, and noticed that her normal brain waves were slower. So she was having the epileptic activity, but the brain waves were slower. So they said, okay, we think it's degenerative. We have to do genetic tests straight away. Um, and so we had to wait two and a half months till those tests came. Um, and during that time, they were trying different medications um, because they couldn't control the myoclonic seizures because they were getting out of hand. Um, and during that time, because she wasn't on the right type of medication that would help manage the symptoms, she actually declined quite a bit. So before she went in, she could still read and write. Two and a half months later, she couldn't read and write anymore. She can't hold a pen and write. And this was my intelligent, beautiful young girl who, you know, would stay after school doing so many activities. She would help and volunteer. She would be into everything. And, um, yeah, and then all of a sudden it changed. It was very, very devastating. Um, and the diagnosis, we got the genetic test pretty much a year after her first seizure. Um, and that was very, very devastating to hear that, you know, it's not just epilepsy that can be managed um it's refractory they will become worse um that the frequency gets more intense and and um the duration is longer and um yeah and then and then uh, I'm, I'm thankful at the moment she's still walking and talking but soon she will be wheelchair bound and then bed bound i can't imagine you you know someone going through that i'm really sorry for yeah. you know that you have to go through that of course but um i have i am hopeful that there are possible research treatments things that can help um and one thing that i wanted to note as well is you know you said not to bring fear to anybody but your daughter was normal so it came as a shock and this is something that has been uh, is common in this disease it's not like you know there are symptoms early on this just kind of happens in early teenage years so it can happen almost to anybody 
I think that's the point. And I think that's why it's so important for patient and patient communities to come together to try to find ways to resolve this issue. And, yeah. and the issue being faster research, faster accelerated funding, because we've done a lot of great things like as human beings, you know, we've done a lot of really interesting research and we've developed drugs that have cured people. So it's not to say that this is an impossible disease to cure. Um, so, but right now there is no cure. And that's why we're talking today to try to figure out how we can advance the ability for people to find a cure. Yeah. Have So you mentioned that she's on a, a clinical trial drug or? She's on a, a trial drug that's by compassionate use. So like an N of one type of drug in Australia. Um, and it's an enzyme replacement therapy, um, which is shown in the lab. Um, to remove the glycogen. So she's been on that for a year now. Um, and we are seeing some little signs of um, in some symptoms being improved, um, but the seizures are still quite strong. But um, but she is improving. Uh, she's still, uh, she's sometimes she can walk and talk better than she was last year. So, um, and she can balance a, a lot more. So she's been doing balance, te balance tests with her physio and she can stand in her balancing position for a lot longer than she was before the treatment. So it's, it's that's positive fun. news. Yeah, that's yeah. really positive. And like one thing you also mentioned is that you know, it took about a year from the first seizure to a diagnosis of the disease. So that's another point of improvement that we can think about and uh, focus on because it would be great if um, the next family who might have a, you know, a child with this disease potentially could find out a few weeks or a month after their first seizure, not a year later, just to be able yeah. to potentially uh, offer them that clinical trial drug, for example. So have you seen when talking to other family members, other people who have um, this disease, is the diagnosis journey getting better or is it still sort of the same? Um, it depends. It, at, at the moment, uh, Angelina's diagnosis was quite quick. Uh, a okay. lot of them are four years, six years into it because mm. the with, with Angelina, the first epilepsy medication she was put on, it actually progressed her disease. Um, and if we'd known, she would have gone on a different epilepsy medication um, where some of them were on the different ones. So it didn't irritate it and they got the, their symptoms were slower. So it still looked like it was epilepsy and the cognitive decline came a little bit slower. Um, and it also depends on the gene mutation as well. So there's some that are faster progressing genes and some of that are slower. So that that does play a part too. Interesting. And um, in terms of testing, are is the testing for the genetic disease, is, not, is that becoming more commonplace? Do they start to do that for babies now? Is there some sort of regulations around that or... With birth screening, um, they can't, they won't put it into birth screening until there's a treatment. Okay. Oh, interesting. Until approved treatment yeah so it's like the, the enzyme replacement therapy that she's on is for Pompe disease um because yeah. uh, Pompe disease is a glycogen storage disorder as well um so i think it just got an it just got approved now that um but in birth screening they'll be picking up Pompe disease am i right dr geordie yes yeah, so the, the problem as as you know the problem with this so that the long journey that uh, the diagnosis imply for rare disease is always uh, the same, not only for Lafora. And the more rare the disease is, the more, the longer the, the journey, I would say. So again, since Lafora is just such an ultra rare disease, so that normally the journey, is, as, as Nikki was saying, is uh, longer than, than in her case. In her case, it was quite quite fast. And I would say that in, 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 in countries like in the United States, in Australia, or in Europe, the, the, the system works uh, smoothly now, and, and the journey is, is shortened. But probably in other countries, this is still this is still an issue, and 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 probably in many underdeveloped countries, the uh, the diagnosis comes very very late or even doesn't come at all. So it, it, that is a problem, a common problem with rare diseases and especially with ultra rare diseases. So of course the doctors that find the patient have never seen a, a, a that disease before. So and um, yeah, so improving as you were saying, improving the diagnosis uh, process would also help. Because the, these um, neurodegenerative conditions, the, the sooner you start like attacking them, the soon the better the results you can obtain uh, are. As, as Nikki was saying, if um, 
the right medication would have been administered uh, at the beginning, things would have been a little bit better. So yeah, di definitely one of the uh, things that we need to improve is the diagnosis and, and how fast we can we are able to diagnose uh, these patients these from La Fora and from other uh, rare diseases. Dr. Duran, one thing you mentioned earlier is that it also depends on the region. Like there are some regions with more di diagnosed La Fora disease patients. What regions are those and do you know why that is? Is it? Yeah. Well, for instance, in, in Europe, there's so the in, in places like the United States where the population is very mixed. So, you know, these genetic diseases are less uh, um, common because precisely because, you know, mixing genes is the best way to not uh, have a, a genetic uh, diseases, you know. So um, in other regions where there's more what we call inbreeding, so people like uh, populations, you know, um, um, you know, relating to each other. And um, then you have certain diseases that, that are more uh, prevalent in that particular region. Like for instance, in La Fora disease in Europe, we have uh, a lot of patients in, in Italy, for instance. So hmm. particular diseases are more prevalent in particular regions because of genetic, um, you know, and, and, and evolution, you know. Interesting. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit to talk about the documentary, Fighting the Rare. So, Dr. Duran, I understand you and your brother sort of produced yes. this or created this. So that's really, really cool. Both of you to come together to do this. Do you want to talk about why you decided to do this? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I really think that we scientists, researchers, uh, and medical doctors should be better at explaining what we do and the importance of what we do and the importance of research and the importance of investing on research. I really think that the general public is not aware of how important it is to invest on these things. Um, so um, I have, my, my brother's a, a film professor, so, um, and he doesn't know anything about what I do. I, know, I don't know anything about what he does. So, but we had always said that we should do something together. And we had this opportunity, you know, and we got a grant to, to you know, to make a, like this kind of a documentary. So let, we said, let's. Where did you to, get the grant from? From a, from a, a um, um, foundation here in, in Catalonia, in my region, uh, that actually the, the purpose of the, um, of the grant was to, um, you know, um, help understand the importance of uh, research, you know? Mm. So, um, uh, yeah, to disseminate on the importance of research. So we, uh, we said, let's try to make a documentary to explain how important research on rare diseases is. And since one of the diseases I work on is La Fora disease, and we had, we were in, in close contact with Chelsea's Hope uh, and, and uh, other uh, researchers uh, that work on the diseases that, that, that are trying to find a cure as we are. So we said, yeah, let's, let's try to explain our, what we do, you know, and, and, uh, and have both the um, uh, testimony of the researchers, but also of the patients and the relatives of the patients. And we had, the, of course, the collaboration of Nikki and Angelina, but also um, and, and other patients and, and relatives. We had Jennifer, the mother of um, and Anissa, uh, also as a, as a testimony of the documentary. So we wanted to explain the results, but also the importance for the patients and the families, also the importance of patients as associations like uh, Chelsea's Hope, uh, so yeah, again, we took advantage of the fact that we are two brothers and we know of each other knows about our, you know, field and, but together we can, you know, um, collaborate and do this documentary and that way and how we do it, we did it. So this might be a good time to also mention that Chelsea's Hope is a nonprofit that helps to bring together, uh, patient advocates and communities around the four disease and Vibe Bio is a partner with Chelsea's Hope as well. So we are very happy to support them and happy to do this as well and very interested in making sure this documentary gets seen by as many people as possible too. So uh, if you're listening to this, watch the documentary. I watched it. It's really great. Um, maybe really quick, we can say this again at the at the end, but where can people watch it? Well, um, we have our, I mean, we, you can find the um, uh, link at uh, Chelsea's Hope webpage or we have or the documentary itself has its own uh, webpage. So it's... Uh, uh, fightingtherare.com so you can find it there actually it is in english but also uh, with, uh, it is dubbed in uh, catalan spanish uh, italian and french so you can watch the commentary in at least that, um, subtitled not that but subtitled in in these five languages excellent um 
So Nikki, you know, I, so recently, how's your daughter doing? I think that's something that people might be interested in. And like, what are some things that you are currently working through? Um, my challenges at the moment with her are behavioral issues. So the, the dementia um, is very, um, is significant. It's a significant symptom. Um, it causes, causes her to be angry, um, confused. Uh, she doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, with anything so it's very challenging I actually had um, Dementia Support Australia and the dementia organization here come and spend a week with us to give us some tips on how to to help us with the challenges um, so that, that's been really difficult but they really help they've given us a whiteboard so we can show her some visuals so when because some because their processing is so slow and sometimes they're just you know they can't put two and two together so to speak to see the visual and and us saying it just helps maybe less give them less confusion because they get confused pretty quickly. So you have to be quite basic and, and say things like in a simple way. But um, th that part is the, is one of the hardest because she's not safe either. She's not safe to walk down the stairs um, because she thinks she can, but then she can't. So you've, you've got to always be there. Um, she will walk out into the road um, and hurt herself or... Yeah, it's yeah. She, she, you know, she can't do anything by herself, pretty much. So that I find that the hardest, and the seizures because the seizures, um, when they are increased in frequency, they hurt, and it's hard to watch her in pain. And you know, when I watched you and your daughter on in the documentary, you know, I was thinking to myself, wow, it must take a lot of energy and um, courage, really, to to talk about this to the public. I don't. I mean, I'm sure when you were when, when she had her first seizure you weren't thinking oh, i want to share this with everybody it was sort of like you know family issue private what was that transition like starting to be more open to sharing um your personal life her personal life too with with the public and and it i know yeah. and tell us why yeah well uh, when i was googling you know you want to find a way to you, you, you know, when you see your child in pain, you want to help them. You want to do the best to the best of your ability to find a way. And to me, if there's a problem, the only way to find a solution is to let people know. And, you know, you can't find a cure if no one knows about it. there's a problem, you know. Um, and so that's sort of my mindset. And um, because, yeah, she, it, it's very hard to watch the suffering. So and when I was doing Google searches or trying to read and research and, you know, the, you know, clinical trials are put on hold and this and that. And I'm like, so there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. And there's got to be other families like me. And some reached out to me via Facebook because I'd done a post, a public post. And we all came together when we realised that no one knew. And we were all stuck and we all needed help because we were like, well, what medication is working for you? Or what have you done for this symptom? You know, um, and it it because it's very distressing. So I found well, if I'm feeling like this, others are feeling like that too. So if I need to create awareness and with a background in marketing, I knew that if I created a social media page, which I did, um, and then followed on to be doing the social media for um for Chelsea's hope as well. So I did that because I realized that we we needed the support. You know, we, we don't have that support and resources for such an ultra rare disease. Say for say for instance, cancer. If you research, you've got support groups, you've got information resources. You know, all all types of help at, at your fingertips, so to speak. But with an ultra rare disease, you don't. Um, and I started it, and so many families started contacting me that I was sending them to the the registry to be registered as a patient. Um, and I think when we when I first started there was 40 patients and now we're up to 80 registered patients because they started reading about it you know and then we all got a closed Facebook group and we all talk and we all share our stories and you know if we're having a hard day you know and only a parent you know or a carer understands how constant it is um, and especially like with dementia dementia is hard but when it's in a young person who has a lot of energy it doesn't stop it's very constant. So it, it can be very exhausting because it's like, I do not have the energy. 
<laughs> to keep up you know uh, because it's it is it's just constant and uh, sometimes it's the behavioral or it's it's some it's always something or it's a seizure and some seizures can just go on for days and it's like day and night day and night um having to be on alert um so I, it, to me I needed to help others and 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 I did that and we've all come together a lot of us and still any newly diagnosed they find us and I'm sure they're very grateful that you did do that um you know they're not feeling as alone as they might have been. So really appreciate that. Um, and one thing you also mentioned during this process of Google searching and looking for ways to help your daughter, uh, there were some clinical trials that you might have seen that might have been put on hold or canceled or things like that. And one of the challenges in rare disease research, of course, is funding. So I want to talk about how funding is a problem and what are you seeing as possible solutions and this can go for either of you as well nikki can start sure yeah well applying for grants um we've done a lot of grants but a lot of the grants that we apply for the funding isn't for clinical trials it's it is for resources uh, helping uh, you know build our skills to set up clinical trials but never funding for trials and of course we need more funding for research like dr geordie joran because we need them to keep researching to find better you know recipes I'm not sure how to explain it <laughs> but um you know so because you know we're we're looking at treatments we want we want to find a cure you know if we can uh get this into birth screening know that they're going to get it when in adolescence and they can start taking treatment then they'll never get the symptoms because the the, the glycogen will never accumulate yeah and that's a good point so when they are younger, you know, children, like, you know, one years old, two years old, the glycogen is still accumulating. There are just no symptoms present because there hasn't been enough accumulation or buildup in the brain for the symptoms to show up. So if we can start early kind of allowing those enzymes, like potentially enzymes or other sorts of treatments to eat away at that gly you know, glycogen and make it work uh, yeah. normally, that would be awesome. Um, potentially like maybe postponing any symptoms for decades potentially what do you think yeah so if that what i was uh, saying before so in any neurodegenerative condition the sooner you start this is completely uh, known that the sooner you start the better the sooner you try to uh, fight the causes of the disease the the better the results uh, and as you we were saying la flora disease since this glycogen keeps building up and accumulating if you stop that accumulation at, uh, uh, sooner then you get uh, and a better improvement, you would get a better improvement of this. Regarding um, research and funding for research, I, I, I have to say that um, this is a disease in which we have progressed uh, very fast on the knowledge of the disease. You know, for, um, maybe 15 years ago, we, we didn't know anything about the disease. And then several groups in the world, we uh, discovered that glycogen is the problem, that if you stop, so if the accumulation of glycogen is the one that underlies this neurodegeneration. So we, in this way, we identified a, 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 what we call a, a therapeutic target. So now, as you were saying, we have something that you can attack, you, you can inhibit, you can prevent the accumulation of this glycogen. And this way you will stop, at least stop the progression of the disease. Um, so uh, as Nikki was explaining before, um, there are drugs that have been developed to stop the accumulation of glycogen in other diseases, like in Pompe disease. And this is the one that is being administered now to, um, uh, to uh, Angelina. But this, is, this uh, drug has to be improved. So this drug, for instance, one of the problems is that it doesn't go into the brain. So it is very difficult for drugs to go into the brain because the brain is, is protected from the rest of the, of the body. So uh, for, particularly for uh, neurologic diseases, one of the big problems to design drugs and treatments is to make these drugs go into the brain and then act, you know? So this is something that also needs a lot of research. This is something that we are in my lab and now also start to, uh, starting to work on. But as you we were saying, we researchers spend a lot of time trying to find funding, trying to find uh, you know, um, money to, you know, to do the research that we need to do in order to uh, finally get to a, an effective treatment that will uh, you know, uh, be successful in treating these patients and, and um, overcoming this terrible disease. So, yeah, we need funding. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that 
one disease that we are seeing a lot in the news lately is Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease, uh, particularly because a lot of older people are living longer now. So there's a lot of prevalence of Alzheimer's. And this is a, you know, the cause is a, I think what they say now is the cause is a buildup of uh, beta amyloid yeah. proteins, particles in the brain. So there's like a buildup. Um, how does that compare to Lafora disease, uh, you know, me mechanistically? And then also like, do you see any uh, ways that I know it's not a rare disease, so that's the other issue, right? Um, funding is easier with Alzheimer's. There's a lot of opportunity for people to make a lot of money. So that's why pharma companies and all these biotech companies are researching this. Um, yeah. Any thoughts there? Yeah. So uh, you are right. So um, Alzheimer's disease shares many uh, aspects with uh, uh, Lafora disease in the sense that many, if not all of these neurodegenerative diseases and go with the accumulation of, of some dirt, of some toxic uh, thing that shouldn't accumulate, but it progressively accumulates and this damages the cells. And then we have the, all these symptoms. So Alzheimer's in this regard is because of the accumulation of beta amyloid, as you were saying, also of uh, another protein that is called tau. So um, there is accumulation of these proteins that shouldn't be there, that shouldn't accumulate, and the accumulation again and damages cells. In the case of Alzheimer's, it's beta amyloid and tau. In the case of uh, Lafora disease, is not a protein but glycogen. But in this regard, they are similar. So, and one thing I wanted to to um, um, people to be aware of, and and something that I also wanted to be uh, included in the documentary, is that by studying a rare disease, you also learn processes and and physiology that is important for other diseases. So, my point is. Studying and trying to find cures for Lafora disease is not important. It's not only important for these 300 or 400 patients that have a disease or the ones that will have it in the future, but by studying Lafora disease, you understand physiologic processes and pathologic processes that might be important for other diseases. So, for instance, this same week we have published an article in which we show that this accumulation of glycogen also plays a role in another disease, in ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So by studying Lafora disease, we have learned a lot from the brain, from the normal uh, function of glycogen in the brain and how important it is glycogen for memory and, and for learning, but also uh, from other neurodegenerative conditions like ALS. And for instance, if we, in this new um, project that we are undergoing uh, to try to find a way for drugs to go into the brain to cure Lafora, these drugs can, if we happen to find this drug that would uh, go into the brain and be effective in treating Lafora. Modif slightly modifying this drug could also be applied to other diseases in which you need to treat uh, the brain and, and ner ner um, nervous tissue. So my point is studying uh, and, and research is important in general, and these are things that are connected. So by studying Alzheimer's, you can learn on Lafora, and by studying Lafora, you can learn on Alzheimer's. That's really interesting. You make a good point. Do you have any collaborations or partnerships with researchers in the Alzheimer's space currently? I'm wondering. If, yeah. I mean, not particularly active, but this is a, Alzheimer's is a field in, that, in which we are also interested. Uh, actually, not only in ALS, but also in Alzheimer's, it has been described that in, in, the, in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, also glycogen accumulates. So it seems like when something goes wrong in the brain and some of this, let's say, dirt accumulates, then everything starts going uh, wrong and other dirt, other things that shouldn't be there accumulate. So in the patients of Alzheimer's, in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, it has been de described that also glycogen accumulates. That. So maybe by preventing the accumulation in Alzheimer's, we would also benefit or slow down the progression of Alzheimer's. So as we have seen now for ALS, we think that if we prevent the accumulation of glycogen in ALS patients, uh, we, we'll, we would also slow down the progression of ALS. So again, by learning how to prevent Lafora or how to cure Lafora, we might have positive impacts on ALS, on Alzheimer's, or in or, on other uh, neurodegenerative conditions. And we would also design and, and, and generate tools that would, be, that would be available for diseases that have nothing to do with glycogen, but maybe that would be, we would generate tools to, for instance, to go into the brain, to deliver uh, drugs and treatments into the brain. So interesting. That's really amazing. Um, are there any current projects or companies or maybe like uh, research studies currently going on that you would like to highlight um, in addition to yours or anything that you're hearing that? Well, I mean, 
should get there some are, attention. There are several groups in the in the in the world working on on lafrodisis. Uh, all of them has, have contributed um, 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 amazingly to the to the knowledge. Again, as as I was saying before, some years ago we didn't know anything about the disease, and now there is a, there is at least one patient, which is uh, Angelina and Nikki's daughter, that is at least trying this compassion this drug in a compassionate use, but it might, at least at, to some extent, might be beneficial. If we, now that we have this first drug, if we know how to improve it, or we try to improve it, it would be probably more, even more beneficial for our patients. Or the, I mean, I could mention a number of, of uh, groups around the world that work on, on, high, on trying to find cures for the disease, but I don't want to forget anybody, so I won't mention any one of That's them. Fair. Of course, I'm our group is only one of the several groups that have um, um, given amazing um, um, advances to the research. Uh, and yeah, again, these, um, these uh, results are not important only for the disease, but also for other conditions. So that's what I want to stress, that we need to invest in, in research in any disease, in any field, because all these researches help each other. Right, and there's many ways that funding can happen through like venture capital, um, you know, angel investors, there's different types of grants, as you mentioned. And I hope like a little bit of everything would be helpful. And the more people that are aware of it can understand the problem and the opportunity to, to help, I think, I hope that they get involved. Uh, what would be a dream outcome as a result of, you know, creating this documentary, fighting the, the rare? Thank you. Lots of doors opening in all ways, in research, in treatments, um, in better managing the symptoms, in better care. Um, yeah, even donations. I think donations are important because donations, there's no return on invest. We don't need to worry about a return on investment. So if that's a good contribution to help and, you know, Joining that together will will get us to the our goal in finding treatments and cures. Thank you for sharing that. I hope so too. I hope it does, um, you know, generate those results, and we will see. And I think that you know, like you mentioned, Dr. Duran, we've learned so much just in the last few years, like in the last uh, ten years or so, of how this disease manifests. So um, we appreciate your work and the work of others in the field. Um, and everyone listening here, please do take the time to watch the documentary. It's very touching, very informative, a lot of surprising things I didn't know about um, in the space. So I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, is there anything else you guys would like to share with the community and the audience here before we? Well, I, I want to stress and, and to uh, appreciate, to uh, acknowledge again the, the importance of the um, testimony of Nikki and, and Angelina and Jennifer and, and her daughter Mariah and Anissa, uh, you know, that have participated in, in the documentary. As you were saying, it, it, comes with a lot of courage from them, you know, to, to uh, tell their, her, their history. Uh, and of course, all the other researchers that have participated in the documentary. And yeah, as Nikki was saying, I hope that this will um, be uh, helpful in opening doors, you know, and, and in making people aware of the importance of research, of funding, of donation, and, and that we can go faster in, in the search for a cure for the disease, for this particular rare disease, Lafora, but also for any other uh, rare disease that is out there. Yep, right, so and like you- Share the documentary to colleagues, friends, family, put on social media, whoever you can think of, that's a stepping stone to reaching our goal. And, and we'll definitely include a link in the, in, in the show notes as well. Um, and one thing you mentioned earlier in the beginning of this is like the numbers and the symptoms of the disease, but the stories, the, Nikki, the story that you're sharing and the stories that others are sharing, really connects with people on a deeper level so they can truly feel i know how painful this disease can be so again thank you both i uh, really appreciate your time and i'm hoping that this will help a little bit uh maybe a lot let's see and and if there's anything else we could do at vibe bio we're here for you thank you thank you we appreciate it very much thank you thank you thank you for having us